Uh, I began to think, you know, how can we relate this to our situation? You know, we don't have a, a big issue in our church about people coming out of Judaism, but we do have people that come out of different backgrounds. And <clears throat> how, how could Paul's words and teachings relate to our situation? And I thought of the last verse of chapter nine. It, as it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Um, <clears throat> that's a, 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 the concept of the stumbling block is one that we find throughout scriptures in different places, going even back to Isaiah. Um, and and we, we sometimes relate that to the Jewish people. And his point being what? The, the coming of Jesus of Nazareth um, was so unexpected, or the, the method whereby the Lord reached out and gave his Messiah was an unexpected one because the Jews expected what kind of a Messiah? <clears throat> you know, conquering. Yeah, or a king, king who would come and throw <laughs> off the foreign powers and uh, give rise to a new independent and powerful Israel, which would be one of the most powerful nations on earth. So that's kind of what they expected. They didn't expect uh, a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem. They didn't expect uh, a young man raised in Nazareth, an out of the way town like Nazareth, <laughs> the home of a carpenter. They didn't expect a man who came and did a lot of different things that was that he didn't come as a military conqueror, he came as one who went into the homes of people who were outcasts from society. They didn't expect that type of a, an individual or that type of a messiah. Uh, I was, as I listened to Patrick this morning and especially his reading early on, uh, and, you know, before he really got into the sermon, I was thinking of this also, as Jesus was on the cross, certainly the Jewish people didn't expect the Messiah who would suffer on the cross as a criminal, the, the concept of the suffering Savior went beyond so many of them. And <clears throat> As Patrick pointed out, so many of the people who went by the cross were kind of uh, making fun of Jesus, you know, say, you know, if you're really the Messiah, you know, come on down from that cross. Uh, if you're really calling as he uh, reached, you know, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, uh, it, uh, well, he's calling on Elijah. If he's really calling on Elijah, he'll come. Uh, you know, so they're, they're, they're not looking for a savior who, who is on a cross. And in a sense, they're not looking. Yes? Okay. They're not looking for a savior who's willing to, to die. To, to them, you know, the ultimate victory would be if Jesus would come down off of that cross, not endure death. 
And so I began to think, what do people expect of the Savior? And, you know, and a deeper question. The Jews expected a Savior kind of much like themselves, one who would, you know, emphasize following every little aspect of the law, would congratulate them for their efforts to do that, and, you know, would be very much like them as Pharisees or as uh, the different sects that they were. And I began to think, well, you know, in our own time, isn't that sometimes the temptation that we have to look upon the Savior and to, or to look for a Savior who's much like we are and is going to more or less ratify what we have done and, and the way that we think it should be done? So, you know, I, that's what I'm kind of wondering. What would Paul write to us about the Savior as a stumbling block? What would he say? You know, in a sense, uh, those who live, you know, in the context of following rules, look for a savior who says, uh, if, if you follow the rules, you kind of, you deserve, you know, salvation. But Jesus is not that way. Because sometimes he suggests that you look beyond the, the rules that have been, you know, the traditions, if you will, that have been uh, encrusted over the centuries on the Jewish law. But what about the Gentiles? You know, he alludes to them, you know, in Rome, and sometimes in a couple of places he says, well, maybe you think that, uh, and we think, my that's silly, but, you know, if you sin, God forgives you, so you, you just go on and, you know, just rely upon that forgiveness. And, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do. In other words, some people might look for a savior that says, well, he's going to forgive whatever I do. And I don't know whether you know, Paul kind of uh, says that's not the case. But in a sense, that's the way sometimes we live, isn't it? You know, we can always get forgiven. But it, it, the Savior is one that says you are not saved by following rules because salvation comes through the grace of God. On the other hand, he's a Savior that says you must live a disciplined life in response to what God has done for you. So don't, don't stumble over that. <laughs> Don't stumble over congratulating yourself for following rules, but don't stumble also over the concept that there are no rules. <laughs> well, I don't know. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I, again, I'm just thinking, you know, what could this message to Jewish and Gentile converts have to say to us today? We come from different backgrounds. Some of us has been raised with, you know, in the church. Others come to the church from different backgrounds. And uh, Jesus can be a stumbling block if we don't really understand his message. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but and so that's kind of the end of the ninth chapter. Um, he said earlier, before we totally leave the ninth chapter, there's those quotes from the Old Testament in verses 25 through 29, where he makes the point to the Israelites that over and over in their uh, 
law or their writings. I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. Uh, it, it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And uh, the point there being people, God has is reaching out to people that uh, sometimes we don't expect. You know, we 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 would just, you know, so and so is more likely to come to Christ, you know. And, and we tend to make that judgment, but the Lord says, you know, sometimes the message could reach people. It, it would surprise us. And, and he goes on. It, it makes a point, 27 and 20, though the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. He's saying there, it's not the whole nation, it's only those who have been justified by faith. That's what the message of Romans is, justification by faith. It's not because of your background. And not everybody's going to be part of the, the, the kingdom of God as Jesus describes it, just because you've been born an Israelite or a Jew. Uh, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah lost to history, but there were some who were amenable and understood in a rudimentary way, perhaps the real message of the Lord. I don't know, does that make any sense? Um, so we have to be careful that we don't stumble over the Messiah. And uh, it's a, Okay, Perry's here. So we, can, <laughs> we, can, we can move on now. Uh, we'll go into the 10th chapter. This is talking about how Jesus can be a stumbling block to uh, concepts of the Messiah. It certainly was in the days of Paul, and it can be today. Because we seek a Messiah who's very much like ourselves. So anyway, we're going to the 10th chapter. In, okay. Well, there's my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Because most of them have rejected the Messiah. And again, uh, we can get entangled into um, trying to figure out, are, are the Jews going to be saved? But that may not be his point here. Anyway, we're going. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Do you ever encounter anybody like that? <laughs> they want to, they're zealous for God, but they're not preaching exactly the right thing. Uh, not based upon knowledge. Uh, and that's the Jews. They preached obeying the rules that that would earn you salvation. But that wasn't according to knowledge because salvation comes as a gift of God. And we have trouble accepting gifts sometimes. Anyway, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's a human, whether we're Jews or whatever we are, that's a, a human thing is that we want to establish our own righteousness. Would that be by following the law? Yeah, I think so in this case, but we all want to, you know, we want to feel good. <laughs> and often we feel good, you know, it's, it's what I have done instead of giving glory to God. Anyway, 
Christ is the end of the law, or the, 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 so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes that the law is leading up to Christ. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. <laughs> There's a... Uh, What's, what's he saying to him there? It's Moses. That's what uh, back in Leviticus, that's the law, right? Moses has that to say as he writes it down. Leviticus 18, 5. Uh, Keep my decrees and laws for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. Uh, what's his point? It's not just enough to have the law. And, and the Jews said, we've got the law, so we're that you, it's not enough to have. You got to do it. <laughs> You've got to obey. It's not just to, good enough to have the statute book on the shelf. Then you got to obey the spirit of the law. Yeah. I think is, that was something in the, Fer the Pharisees obeyed the law. On, you know, it's, the Sadducees obeyed the law. They just, they sometimes forgot about that there's a spirit behind the yeah. law. Yeah. A spirit of love, love for God and love for you, fellow man. And then the righteousness that is by faith, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven uh, or who will. To bring Christ out, or who will descend into the deep? Some translates into, you know, the nether regions, if you will. Hell, uh, it, that is to bring Christ up from the dead, the place of departed spirits. Kind of a odd thing to say. Um, it's. It's, you know, and it's been abused. It's not by, you know, super great deeds that we do. You know, somebody heroically goes to heaven or hell. And that's, it's, it's an understanding that the Lord is near. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That's something that has to be, you know, you have to go on a pilgrimage to find it or something like that. I don't know. It's fun. <laughs> That's I can do. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so that is the word of faith we are proclaiming that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. So uh, there's one of the verses that we use for what we, the little ceremony we do when we immerse someone, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? And then uh, they say, yes, sometimes that's the only thing they say. But uh, what what's the point? Is it, is that the confession? It's, Part of it, I guess we might say, but it's a continuing confession also. I think if you can, it's not a one time thing that you kind of do in a muffled voice and, uh, <clears throat> and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Uh, <clears throat> so, that why is he saying that? To, in order that we know what to do when we baptize someone. He doesn't even talk about baptism here. 
because that's not his purpose. His purpose here is to say salvation comes through faith in Christ, not through obedience to a, a set of rules. And that's the contrast I think he's making here, that it's belief. <clears throat> but here again, a lot of people that you'll meet talk about belief and it is essential. And he's gonna go on to talk more about that. But what else? That belief leads you to do something. Here it's confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Uh, other places, that except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus says in John, except you be born again of the water of the Spirit. So this is what he's emphasizing here uh, in, in the context of who he's writing to. Uh, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. <coughs> for it is with your heart, and uh, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. <clears throat> For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What is that? Is that his plan of salvation? In a sense, but he's mainly, what's the emphasis? Uh, what word is, is he emphasizing? Everyone is the, is the key to that verse. Everyone, not just Jews, not just Gentiles either. But uh, so he's trying to put everybody on the same plane that all can have faith, call in the name of the Lord. And uh, that's, that's what we've been trying to say. What does this stuff have to do with us? <laughs> you know, and that, that's the point is that we come from different backgrounds, but again, whoever calls on the name of the Lord bows down and does what he says, submits self. So, uh, Not works. It's uh, here's here's one that we hear so often. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? So faith, faith and belief are the same. And how can Alan. they believe? Yes. Alan. Uh, or when you um, be a television evangelist and they tell people to. I'm sorry? When, when, you, when you listen to the uh, television evangelist and yeah. they tell uh, television, all they have to do is touch the screen and profess that Jesus is Lord. Or, that, All you uh, have to do is, is what? Yeah, what and if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be. Yeah. Just touch the screen you, so, you have there. And send money. It's, yeah, usually send money or uh, do this or that. I mean, you've got to be careful when people tell you what to do that it's in accordance with the scripture and that you don't just pull one verse. Now, here, these verses are talking about salvation, but his purpose here is to show that salvation is not by, we, that we earn it through the works that we do, it's through the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And that faith, again, leads you to confess with your mouth. If you just touch the screen, I have to confess with your mouth. Jesus is the son of God. 
I'm not sure that you've done what Jesus himself said. And that you need, you must be born again, born of the water and of the spirit. Those are all aspects of it. And so we need to read more than just one place, right? And uh, so, <clears throat> and he's getting into that here uh, you, to believe you have to hear. And to hear, you need someone to preach the gospel to you. That's when we studied Acts, that was the key, wasn't it? How that the Lord got a preacher to people who were open to the teaching. The Ethiopian eunuch and uh, Philippi throughout the world, the, the Lord found a way to get a preacher to them. If you look back at your life, you can find somebody who preached the gospel to you. Maybe it was a parent, maybe it was some guy in the pulpit. Uh, maybe it was someone in a Bible class. Maybe it was someone that you studied with independently. Somebody preached. Somebody uh, showed you what you need to do. Uh, and how can they hear without preaching? How can they preach unless they are sent? It's just written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so that's the key or one of the key places for what? Supporting missionaries, you know? How beautiful are the feet of those who... Uh, dedicate their lives to this work uh, because that's what it takes. That, and, and we can talk about television uh, Linda, and that it, television can have a tremendous impact reaching a lot of people, but I think it's still the bottom line is one person talking to another. Ultimately, it's down to that, isn't it? We need one another. I don't know, you think Paul would have changed his uh, uh, letter if he had television? And internet. <laughs> that he would. Maybe that's the way you talk to somebody on Zoom now. Yeah. To you, President, going coming to your house. But it's still some someone talking to someone else. That's the way that we come to know Jesus, isn't it? Um, oops. Okay, so now the, we get into the uh, latter part of the, the chapter. Um, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Where does that come from? Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 53. Sometimes we read that in connection with the Lord's Supper, Isaiah 53, because it goes on to talk about the Messiah, but that's where it, that's the first part of Isaiah 53. Actually, the thought begins at the latter part of the 52nd chapter, but which we don't read. But, uh, who has believed our message? His point is a lot of people didn't. For Isaiah says, Lord, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Uh, who's the they? The Jewish people? I think so. Is it given what is going on to say their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And again, I ask, did Israel not understand? In other words, they've had an opportunity to accept the Messiah. And Paul has gotten around. Paul is one missionary, but uh, some, you know, tradition tells us that other 
people went out preaching. We don't know exactly how many missionaries there were and were all they ministered, but uh, he's saying that the word has got out. There were voices going into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, I asked, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. What, what's his point there? Deuteronomy. That comes from Deuteronomy. So that's Deuteronomy 32, 21. I will, uh, they made me jealous by what is no God and angered me with their worthless idols. So that's the first part of the verse in the Old Testament. Then the second part, I will make them envious by those who are not a people. I will make them angry by a nation that has no understanding. <laughs> What's he saying to Israel there? <clears throat> You have made me angry. Now you're going to be rejected and I'm going to work with some people who are not a people. They're not. And who are those people? Was he looking forward to? I think so. The fact that um, Christianity is for all. Yeah, the Gentiles. So Paul is, he always goes to the Jewish people first, Yeah, but then consistently... He's rejected, and then he um, he goes to the Gentiles. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, a people that they consider, you know, barbarian and so on, that God's going to work with them. Uh, I will make you interest. Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. And uh, so that's near the end of Isaiah chapter 65. But again, talking about what's his point here? The Jews as a body have missed the boat. And, but, but God's word is not, he has not failed in some way because he never promised, again, the, he never promised that all Israel would be saved and they would be the only ones who would be saved. He has always had his eye on the, those of faith, whether they be Israelites or others. So looking at the situation in the first century here is not saying that God has had to rearrange his plan, uh, but He's always been working toward for salvation by faith. Uh, but concerning Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to disobedient and obstinate people. Patience. That's what Patrick mentioned in his <laughs> sermon. The Lord's patience is somehow sometimes misunderstood. Alan, it, it reminds me of, of John 8, where Jesus is talking to the Jews, and he says, you know, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And, you know, their counterargument is that, you know, we're, we're the children of Abraham. We haven't been slaves to, to anyone. And, you know, what yeah. he is, what he's telling them is, you're not listening to, to me, <laughs> right? Because you, you want to kill me. And so I'm saying these words, but you're not listening because you're the son of your own fathers, not Abraham as the father is the message. But it reminds me a lot of when he was speaking to the people and they weren't weren't accepting him for who he was. And, and now you have the same thing, you know, post the establishment of the church where Paul is is telling them the truth, but they're wanting to go back to their their Old Testament ways versus accept the, the New Testament ways. And I think that that seems like a good parallel to me. Yeah. yeah. So again, this is not an unexpected development. It's, it's all of 
in God's wisdom. And again, he's, he's dealing with people with different backgrounds. Uh, okay. The remnant of Israel is the way this chapter 11 is in time. Any more comments on that? And that, on that? What it might mean. I asked them, did God reject his people? Yeah. Is Israel just gone and lost? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham. He could trace his lineage, I'm sure, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Uh, and he's talked about foreknowledge before here. It's He's Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Uh, when, when was that? Remember the occasion wasn't it after he um they were up on the mountain and yeah. uh they um killed all of the, the prophets of, of baal, baal after yeah. god uh, burned up um, the the it altar. was the competition right yeah right. yeah about Carmel. And uh, it was a good victory for Elijah because the fire of the Lord came down and his message uh, about Jehovah was vindicated. But then the Queen Jezebel said, I'm going to get this guy. And so he heads out of town into the wilderness south of Israel and then he's encountered there. And he's feeling down about himself. I'm all alone. I'm the only one. And the Lord provides this assurance. Kind of, uh, I, you know, he's, he's not pleased with Elijah's attitude there. Sometimes we have that attitude. I'm the only one who's got it right. But uh, anyway, it, I'm not, I've reserved for myself 7,000. That's a pretty good number, but compared to the population, it's, it's low, but there's still uh, some. There's still what he calls in other places the remnant. What was the population? Well, by, based upon the size of the armies that were counted from time to time in David's time, and even a little bit later, I've always thought that the population of uh, Israel was about the same as that of the city of Chicago. But, uh, you yeah, know, two, three million. I mean, uh, among that, it's uh, 7,000 isn't a whole lot. I don't know if we have 7,000 members. That if you look up all the congregations, of the Church of Christ in the city of Chicago. We've got several hundred. Anyway, uh, but the point is the Lord is, uh, is a, attentive to everyone. So at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. Not all Israel is lost. Some are saved. A few. Paul doesn't say how many at this time. And, uh, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then, what Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain. They were looking for a Messiah to lead them out of uh, subjection to the uh, a Grecian Empire and then the Roman Empire. Uh, but the elect did. Those who put their faith in Jesus. The others were hardened, <laughs> as it is written, 
God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they could not see and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. That again, is a, some words that we find in various places throughout the scriptures that again, it kind of like that description of Jesus as a stumbling block. The people just, just don't get it because they're looking for something else. Only a few get it. Uh, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. So not a pretty picture of Israel, but uh, anyway, uh, he's going to talk about in the latter part of this chapter, we'll, we'll ask, is he going to, he's talking about, is he talking about the future, the past, or the present in the latter part of this chapter? We'll ask that question and deal with it next week when he talks about uh, all Israel will be saved, are the words. It's been one of the most debated <laughs> verses in Romans. But we'll take it up next time at Romans 11, 26. So we'll, we'll get there. Thanks for your attention and, uh, and your thoughts and wisdom. <laughs>